Welcome back to We Talk Money, episode 125. Stocks are crashing. Bitcoin is booming. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, we've been uh, gone for a couple of weeks, but we are back in action and have a ton of to talk about. We're just kicking off earnings season. We had a big breakout on Bitcoin. We've got a lot of macroeconomic stuff to talk about. Um, things are really getting interesting, and I think this episode is right on time. So, Trav and Nikki, what have you guys been up to? What are you looking at? What's the big thing that people need to know about or think about or be watching out for this week? I'll start with the technicals because I've been ad nauseum talking about this 4,200 level in the S&P 500, which we're basically looking like we're going to break down through that level. It's a very, very key level. So I think from here, I talked about this in our stock market update on Monday in the wealth building community, how I think that now is a prudent time to kind of sit and watch and, and wait a little bit. You know, when we get to these really, really key levels, um, sometimes it can be nice to pay, quote unquote pay for a little bit of confirmation and kind of see where sentiment is heading. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm, we're there. We're at the important level. We look like we're probably going to break down through it. That could give us a whole nother wave of selling in stocks. Um, and I just think a wait and see approach right now is prudent. Trav, Google was down like, almost 10% on the day based on earnings, but they didn't look that bad, did they? No, they really didn't. Uh, you know, there were some disappointments about some of the guidance about how fast the, the cloud division is growing. But overall, I mean, the numbers themselves for Q3 didn't look that bad. I think there was just a lot of expectations going into the report. You know, Google's up quite a bit year to date, even now after today's sell-off. But we've seen a lot of disappointments this earnings season. You know, there have been some positives like Netflix and Microsoft and Spotify were up after earnings, but a lot of the other companies, you know, Tesla missed its numbers and was down pretty heavily. Uh, Google down heavily today. We've seen the banks selling off despite what were pretty decent earnings reports from the big banks last week. So I think so far from what we've seen this earnings season, we are seeing net negative reactions on balance. Although, of course, we do have some positives, like I said. But yeah, it's coming at a tough time in the market, too. You know, it's interesting when you look at the indices, like Nikki mentioned, those are finally cracking. But if you look under the surface, the, the market internals have been awful over the past couple of months. In fact, I was writing in the Daily Joe just a couple of days ago about how if you look at the percentage of stocks that are above their 50-day or 100-day moving average, the number is quite low. We have a lot of stocks that are well below their 50-day and 100-day moving averages now, a lot of stocks hitting fresh lows. In fact, about 80% of stocks are now below their 100-day moving average. So there's a lot of carnage that's happened beneath the surface here in the stocks. And, you know, a lot of that's been driven by what's going on in the bond market and the uncertainty out there in the world with wars and everything else happening. So it's been a really tough time. I actually didn't really get the memo that I should wait. So I've already been nibbling on some stocks. I think there's some really interesting bargains out there now. And I'm actually really excited because those bargains could get even better here in the months ahead. Yeah, picking exact bottoms is tough, but I like how you posted this chart in the Daily Doe talking about um, the percentage that is below the 100 period moving average. And we're getting into that territory, like you pointed out here, where when you get to, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent historically, at least over the past decade, that's been a really great time to buy. So it seems like you guys are at least from the risk reward standpoint, starting to nibble um, when things are kind of in their juicy territory. Yeah, that's right. That there's been a lot of uh, stocks that, you know, when you look at the index, it's kind of telling a different picture. You know, earlier I'm talking about referencing the index and 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 if you're looking at investing broadly in the market, but under the surface, like Trav has brought up, individual names have gotten to reasonable valuations. And so it has been um, kind of a, a weird thing where we're waiting and seeing on the broad market, but uh, underneath the surface, individual stocks are actually showing value that's ready to start to pounce on. And that's why we both have been nibbling on positions. But um, yeah, I, I do think that it's interesting how that dynamic has played out just because the Magnificent Seven has has kept the market, the broad index um, afloat pretty well so far. 
Well, one thing that I think is probably the most interesting thing to look at right now is the inverse correlation that we finally see from Bitcoin and the stock market. You know, ever since the top in November of 2021, so basically almost two years ago that um, since we had the all-time high in Bitcoin, there's just been a lot of correlation between the stock indices and Bitcoin. But what's really interesting is here in mid-October, actually starting on like Thursday, October 12th, Bitcoin had a pivot bottom, a pivot low, and has been trending to the upside ever since then, where that was actually a pivot high for both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 where the S&P, for you guys watching on the video, you can see this is where we got rejected off of the 100 period moving average at 44.40. And during Bitcoin's big rise here, stocks have been inverse to that. And this is actually, not that I want to see the stock market go down, but this is what I like to see, at least for Bitcoin, where when we start to see, even when stocks are bearish, that Bitcoin can buck that trend, and continue to the upside, that's a sign of real strength and capital flow coming in, not just as like a sympathy play on the stock market, but there's something going on there, right? And what is the big narrative? Well, I actually posted a, a video yesterday talking about this, but kind of the, the big thing right now is the anticipation that a Bitcoin spot ETF is coming. And there was a listing on the DTCC, did I say that right? DTCC's website? Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, in, in an anticipatory posting of a ticker symbol, assuming that something is coming down the line. And I do think the writing is on the wall and it's only a matter of time now that the SEC has been basically laughed out of the courts and they really have no leg to stand on to defend a, why they shouldn't approve a spot Bitcoin ETF. So I think it's coming. Um, do you guys have any opinion or perspective on it from that angle? Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's just a, a matter of, of when at this point, uh, because, you know, the SEC isn't, isn't doing any new challenges of the, uh, the applications that we've seen so far, or, or, or I'm sorry, they're not appealing the ruling that, that just went against them. So that's a, an interesting signal for sure. The DTC C stuff is an interesting signal. I am asking myself the question, will this be a buy the rumor, sell the news event? And I think that's worth thinking about in terms of on the day of the first approval, you know, could we see a pop and flop uh, because, you know, finally the thing that people have been waiting for happens and then there's sort of like a hangover and, and you know, there's yeah. uh, people that were in the trade for that catalyst then start to take profits on the trade. But I do think even if that happens, even if we do see a sell the news on the day of you know, there is going to be buying pressure coming from these ETFs. And so over time, demand through those ETFs will hopefully flow through. It just may take a while. So we'll have to see, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about how much AUM is going to flow into those vehicles once they're live. And that will be the, the true test of whether or not these actually matter for the price of BTC longer term. Yeah. Whenever I think about what that looks like on a multi-year basis, Right. We, we always use the example of what happened to gold, where in the early 2000s, the uh, gold ETF, GLD, and a few others were approved. And we know what happened there. Right. And I think this is what people are kind of looking at as a potential, um, a potential, I guess, not sympathy play, but example of what could happen. And what we saw in the early 2000s was gold basically go from like three or 400 bucks to now it's up around 2000. And so, yeah, I think you're, you're right, Trav. Like the, initially there's going to be this kind of euphoric buying in, in anticipation of an approval. And then maybe on the day or the week or even the whole month of an actual approval, maybe there's some kind of pullback. It's, it's I think too early to tell, but one thing that I'm looking at and one thing I always like to remind myself is the fact that price action is truth, right? If you get overwhelmed with opinions or news articles or whatever, I think the best thing to do is just to come in and look at the price action and see what it's telling us. And there's been a really clear narrative. I actually posted, uh, I think a week or two ago, I've been on vacation, riding my motorcycle through the desert. So I've been a little disconnected, but what, what I posted was basically a walkthrough 
of the story that the Bitcoin chart has shown us so far this year. And it's actually really interesting. You know, we started basically mid-January, kicked off the year, shifting from an extended bear market to shifting into bull market price structure, right? So we got above the moving averages. We started making higher highs and higher lows in price. Then we had the, the banking crisis, you know, that was a great buying opportunity for me here at 20K. And then we continue to make higher highs and higher lows. But actually, Bitcoin has been dead flat since mid-March. So for over 200 days, we were using 28,000 as kind of a magnet price where we were oscillating under and over it. And then just a few days ago, we actually did get this big breakout above that massive resistance level of 30K. And what makes that even more compelling of a resistance level is when you look, zoom out really big and look at the yearly chart, you can see that this 30K zone was a very important price level going back all the way to 2020. Um, it was the high and the close of 2020. It was the open and the low of 2021 and mid range of last year. And that's why I think it took so long to consolidate around that zone. And then finally, we got that push up. So it'll be really interesting to see where we close this yearly candle. We've got, you know, just over two months left in the year. And so, yeah, if bulls can hold us above 30K, we've now got about six months until the next halving. So the Bitcoin block rewards halving is coming in late April. So basically this big circle, this big circle through, you know, the next six months is the big question. Like, are we going to make runs for new all-time highs? If we follow what's happened over the last two halving cycles, that I think is the highest probability scenario. Obviously nothing's guaranteed, but you know, we've got price action intact. We've got the, the having narrative. We've got, you know, the inflation narrative and the flight to safety. We want to call Bitcoin a, some type of safe, safe haven asset. So I don't know. I, I think it's just really dangerous to, to be short or bearish on Bitcoin right now. You know, something that I've been thinking about, um, a lot is, we don't have many opportunities like this in our lifetime where we have this quote unquote new asset that is on board that we can add to a portfolio, right? Like it's been the same old assets for a very long time and maybe things have changed here and there, but for the most part, and I've been thinking about how not owning some Bitcoin could end up being one of the biggest regrets that people end up having. Um, it, it's just one of those situations where even just having a little bit can, uh, make a big impact on a portfolio. And I feel like if there's anything that people are going to look back and kick their butts about later in life, not doing, it could be putting some Bitcoin in a portfolio or just like having some allocation of some kind. So I don't know. I was thinking about that a lot as I as I consider the no regret strategy that I'm always teaching and talking to community members about. And um, I know that a lot of people are still hesitant to 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 own Bitcoin and they just think it's a scam or they think it's not going to last. But, you know, it's it just proves itself over and over that it's not going to die. And yep. if anything, this is just continuing that narrative that it's stronger than people think. Um, especially the resilience through the bear market in stocks that we had. So, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. I think people need to consider that. It's wild how, you know, naysayers even today are, use the same stupid arguments that we were dealing with a decade ago, right? Literally in 2013, a lot of the same things that we were hearing, you still hear people say today. And it's like, how much evidence do you need that something's working? right? How, how many years of risk adjusted, amazing returns do you need? And yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it happen multiple times where people have that FOMO and that regret. And it's like when prices in a bear market, oh, it's a scam. It's dead. It's gone. When Bitcoin's price is high, oh, it's a bubble. It's overblown, right? So like when is the best time? You know, I guess either be tactical and trade like we do and understand market cycles and trade setups or just dollar cost average and have some skin in the game. Totally. 
So, yeah, I don't know. That's uh that's a I think a really good spot where we are leaning into this you know, two quarters before the having um what else is happening out there? I know mortgage rates continue to go up. Bond rates are actually climbing back up. Let's just take a look real quick. You can see the official um mortgage rate is uh, just came out this week, just shy of 8%, but we know actual mortgage rates that people are getting are closer to or above 8%, which is wild to think about that just a year or two ago, we were down in the twos. I mean, the market, the real estate market is just absolutely locked right now. Yeah. For existing home sales, we've seen uh, the numbers tick down to I think an annualized rate of about 4 million and it looks like it may head lower. New home sales new home sales are still hanging in there for the reason that we talked about before which is that the home builders are doing rate buy downs, aggressive rate buy downs. In fact, we've had a couple of home builders report this week and you know their numbers still look okay although even their numbers are starting to weaken a bit. Uh, but they're buying down mortgage rates from 8% to about five and a half right now. Um, but as those rates keep going higher, you know, the buy downs, you know, are still happening at higher rates. And so that's something that, um, you know, can't go on forever if rates keep rising. Now, generally, if we step back and look at the bond markets, which is what's really driving mortgage rates higher, you know, it's been a, a total roller coaster this year, and it's just been a disaster overall for bonds. So bond prices down heavily, bond yields up, and lately the story's been bond yields on the long end of the curve. So the 10-year, 20-year, 30-year bonds are really what's seen uh, the fastest rise lately. And so we were saying, you know, we've been uh, pretty heavily invested on the short end of the curve with T-bills yielding 5 plus percent because of the long yield was so inverted for a while. Well, now that inversion has almost gone away and you do have these longer term yields up a lot. There's a lot of reasons being thrown around for why this has happened so quickly. And of course, you have people like Bill Ackman that have been short long term bonds. And, you know, he was right, although he did just cover his short this past week. Uh, but the reason, of course, has been, you know, high deficits or concerns about the U.S. fiscal position. There have been people that said it's a supply demand issue, although really the Treasury hasn't been issuing that many long term bonds this year. It's mostly been at the front end of the curve. And so supply demand, not really as much of the factor, I think, that's driving it. Honestly, the thing that makes the most sense to me is that these stronger economic numbers and this higher for longer idea that people are now on board with is really, I think, what's driven those rates. And so um, we got like a higher than expected retail sales number last week. We've had, you know, the, the unemployment rates remaining low. And those are the things I think that have kept this narrative going. However, I think we're at a very interesting and pivotal point because I think this narrative is about to dramatically shift in the next six to 12 months. Uh, so I actually think now could be a very interesting time to actually get into bonds, whether you're short, medium or long term parts of the curve, because and I tend to favor the short end of the curve, but nonetheless, I think across the curve is going to be interesting because we just had a head fake in the official inflation numbers where the August and September data was higher than the previous months. But that's about to flip again. The October numbers have been coming down. We know that the shelter numbers are going to weigh on CPI for, for most of next year. So we're actually about to flip into a scenario where you can get behind the narrative that inflation is cooling again. And that's where it's going to be interesting to see how bonds react to that, because we've been in this hotter, hotter moment, higher for longer, but people seem to think that that's going to continue. And I think when you look at how the math pencils out on the official data, we're about to roll over on the inflation numbers again. One other thing, recently gas prices just over the past few weeks have started to come back in. That could also help CPI in the coming couple of months. So I don't know. I think we could shift pretty quickly again from this uh, rates are going higher, U.S. fiscal positions out of control to actually inflation numbers coming down. Next year, you got an election. You could have actually some fiscal tightening. Uh, and therefore, we could shift from higher for longer inflation to what if the economy rolls over? You might actually want to be in bonds and not in riskier assets. And so I think a uh, long-winded explanation, but I think we're at a really interesting pivotal time here for bonds. Those are some great points. So just pulling up some charts here. So we're, we're taking a look at um, gasoline futures. Yeah, you can see gas peaked out last summer around like, you know, the mid fours and is sitting in the low twos right now and has recently over the past couple of months sold off from like three back to almost two. So yeah, that's definitely some deflationary pressure, I guess. And then taking a look at the... Um, 
the Fed watch, it looks like the market is still pricing in for rates to stay the same through now looking like next summer, maybe. Do you agree with this or how, how do you guys see rates playing out? I do. I think the Fed is is not only done because the the long end of the curve has tightened financial conditions and sort of done the the rest of the tightening job that they wanted to do that sort of done the work for them. I think they're done because of that. I think they're not going to be able to justify raising rates any further with CPI coming down again. They're not going to be able to justify it if the economy weakens. And I wrote about this in today's Daily Doe. If you look at all the, the major bank earnings reports that we just had last week, I went through all the transcripts and we're listening to what the CEOs and bank executives were saying. And they're all essentially calling out that, yes, consumer spending is still up in Q3, but we're seeing interesting cracks. We're seeing signs that things are deteriorating, especially at the lower income levels. And uh, so that's that's something that I think is worth noting because they're seeing in real time, uh, especially at the low end of the market, a decline and a higher delinquency rates on things like credit cards. So they are seeing- And vehicles, know, right? Yep. Yep. That's Auto right. Auto loans so, are a mess. Yeah. Yep. And so a lot of these lag effects that are due to higher rates are starting to finally, I think just now, start to affect some of these macroeconomic variables. So I think we're just on the front end of seeing cracks in the economy from the effects of monetary policy. So yeah, my guess is Fed is done. I think they probably already over tightened and they may be backpedaling in three to six months. So what you're saying is the Fed is typically behind the curve. <laughs> You mean they, they don't have foresight to make really smart decisions? Oh, don't, don't get don't get me yeah. going. Don't get me going. Open why were there. they buying why were they buying mortgage bonds, you know, in 2021? I just I still to this day I cannot believe that they were doing that. It's just unfathomable. <laughs> Trav for Fed chair. I don't even think the Fed knows what they're doing. They're just kind of, you know, by by their comments, I think even they are just full of uncertainty and don't really know and Yep. How can, you know, I don't know. I want, I, I'm with I, Trav. I don't think they're hiking anymore. I'm on, I'm, I'm starting to get into the more extreme abolish the fret, the abolish the fed <laughs> mentality. I think, <laughs> uh, I've been tweeting about how I think, you know, a decade or two or three from now, we could actually be on like algorithmic or even crypto based monetary. One policy. of us, one <laughs> of us. <laughs> yes. Welcome to the dark side trap. <laughs> Hey, speaking of the dark side, uh, even crypto people won't like that. I'm about to say this, but oh. you know, uh, a chart that, I mean, I've been saying this for years now, one of the strongest looking charts out there right now is gold. Um, very, very interesting. If you look at the monthly chart, massive cup and handle, I think we're going to be at 2,700 within the next year. Wow. I like that. That's prediction. my unofficial prediction. Um, yeah, if 2K breaks, I mean, there's so much open air from like 2000 to, you know, 26, 2700. So I don't know. I've got some gold. I don't think I'm going to buy any more. I've got it all buried in Trav's backyard. And um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it's such a slow chart, but it is a beautiful chart. It is pretty. I, I don't know if it's like, Trav, I'd be curious why you think gold is rallying because, you know, real rates are essentially positive so what's happening here is just fear is it monetary policy fiscal policy fears um yeah. recession fears is it more so fear-based versus something else yeah no i think that's a good a good point i think it is i think there's some uncertainty premium here i think there's you know some monetary alternative premium here i think if you look at the relationship between real rates the relationship is broken uh, at least in the last year or so. So, you know, gold used to trade inversely to real rates. So with real rates up so much recently, you'd think gold would be down, but the opposite has happened. So the relationship right. between real rates and gold is broken. Uh, we really can't use that as a guide, at least for now, as to where gold is going. And so, yeah, I think you have to look at, well, what else is driving it? You know, could it be things in the currency market, what other central banks are doing? Could it be uh, things like, you know, wars and just general uncertainty, Higher deficits obviously could play a role too, as it you know just becomes more attractive from a um, you know a debasement perspective. So, or, or you know obviously a solution to debasement. So it's kind of like in in some ways I think similar to what's happening in in Bitcoin, but just uh you know on a much slower level. As Chris said, it's you know it's not as the returns aren't as exciting as, as say Bitcoin. Uh, you also I think with gold, you know you have a little bit more supply inflation over time, and so 
and there's also the paper gold market. So there's some big differences. Um, and I've, I've tended to pr pr prefer Bitcoin uh, recently, but I do think a gold allocation can make some sense, especially because historically it's played an interesting hedge role during times of economic uncertainty. So yeah, I can't uh, fully explain it given the variables that I'm looking at, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's clear that some of the, some of the things we've talked about could be, could be driving it. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I don't usually pull up a Bitcoin gold kind of comparison chart, but you can clearly see this, this run with Bitcoin has been accompanied by gold as well. So I don't know, maybe, maybe the gold Bitcoin markets are the new correlation and the NASDAQ is so 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the NASDAQ is still up quite a bit, you know, year to date. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> 20 something percent, which is shocking. What? What it's is it? Oh, back. yeah. Bitcoin's up over 100% on the year now. Wow. Hey, man. Wow. GBTC that, haters. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. GBTC is up over 200%. That's been a good trade for us this yeah, year. Yeah, that, that has, the, uh, man. You nailed that one. You nailed it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, everyone yeah, so. thought you were crazy at the time, but. <laughs> yeah, when that premium blew out to almost 50% to the, the value of its its assets or the discount to the assets blew out to about almost 50% at the uh, the peak hysteria and peak fear over DCG last year in early November. Uh, that's when we knew to step in. We did the work on the on the documents, on the structure to get some comfort. And obviously there was still some uncertainty, but, you know, the risk reward was just too good. Uh, so the yep. the discount to net asset value, I think today is is tightened back to like around 12 or 13 percent. So probably won't tighten to zero until you get some ETF approvals. But the the dual tailwind of Bitcoin's rise plus the closing of the discount has been a really, really nice trade for us in a year that's been choppy and difficult in some other areas. So it's a really nice to get that win. Yep. Um, we've actually got a bunch of questions. You guys want to do some Q and A, or is there anything you want to cover before we jump into that? Oh, just got more earnings, big tech earnings for the rest of the week. And we'll have to just see how that goes. Yeah. Let's take a look at that calendar real quick. Um, I guess we are just, I guess this is the first big week and then it's going to continue into the next couple of weeks. What is there anything you guys are really looking at closely over the next few days or any bellwethers? I, I'm paying attention to like the ad businesses right now, like the metas and, you know, Google came out and had some things to say about that and snap, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if the ads business is back in action. So hmm. I'm, I'm, it'll be interesting to see what meta comes out with. Yeah, certainly the big tech bellwethers are always very important, especially, you know, we see that today with Google kind of bringing down the NASDAQ and then, you know, that causing momentum driven selling and just pulling down the whole market. So, you know, I think Meta after the close today, Amazon tomorrow, Apple, I believe next week will be key because it's been, you know, such a stalwart performer, even though, you know, the numbers haven't been that great with, with Apple's earnings this year, the stock has held up quite well. So that'll be very important for the market. And yeah, and then everything in the portfolio. Yeah, so we'll have a very busy rest of this week in stock earnings. And then also uh, next week will also be another jam-packed week. So yeah, there's just a lot of different reports to go through and uh, a lot of you know interesting stock reactions happening. So very, very good time to be dialed in here in the, as a stock investor. Nice. All right. Well, a lot to look forward to. Um, let's jump into some Q&A, shall we? Raz was asking, how do you not run out of capital in a long bull market? Like, what are some strategies to help you take profit so you can buy future dips without missing on upside of longer uh, term uptrend? So, yeah, how do you not run out of capital in a bull market and have dry powder to keep trading? What, what do you guys do? I mean, I always keep like a certain percentage of the Act, so I guess it depends on, you know, what you're doing here. If you're actively investing in stock picking versus just passively investing in ETFs or mutual funds, there's those are two different strategies, right? In a passive portfolio, you don't really want to have cash on the sidelines. You want to be invested. Um, and then in an active portfolio, you're going to be managing your cash position a bit differently. I always try to keep cash on hand at all times because... Um, you never know when a stock opportunity is going to come up. Earnings move stocks 
all the time um, in, in different ways, sometimes extreme ways. And you want to be able to capitalize on those opportunities when they come. So for me, I'm always keeping some dry powder in my active portfolio. Sometimes though, I have way more cash than others. Like this year I've had more cash and I've been slowly deploying that. Um, and some years I, I don't have as much. Um, it just depends on the opportunities that are, are coming to me at that time. Yeah, I think those are great points for me. I'm definitely going to a lower cash position when things are ripping. Um, well, hopefully I'm going to a lower cash position actually just before they rip as we get into you know the depths of the bear market. That's really where I'm trying to deploy the rest of my capital to not sit on a massive cash position. And uh, But the other thing, of course, in a bull market is I'm trimming a lot of positions as they get to my targets or as the risk reward gets worse, you know, as things get more euphoric, I'm trimming. And so there is, you know, continual additions to the cash pile. So for me, that that helps to, you know, really add to the cash pile. And then hopefully at the, near the top of the market, I actually have built like a pretty sizable cash pile because of that. But yeah, yeah. it's um it's not a necessarily an exact science, but. Yeah, I definitely see the the cash position change throughout the the market cycle as you hopefully deploy cash at near the bottoms if you're you know doing it right. The other thing, of course, we haven't mentioned is income. Like, hopefully, you you know if you've got a spread between uh, what you're taking in versus what you're spending, then you can be adding even during the bull market every month a little bit to your retirement accounts or your trading accounts if you've got excess income. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that like my whole mentality with the investing machine is like. Make sure you're doing what you can to maximize cash flow to be able to put back into the markets, especially when things are trading with conviction. Um, and yeah, another point that you said, Trav, that I agree with is like recycling, right? So like in the crypto world, I'll trade altcoins in and out to accumulate more fiat that I can recycle back into my longer term Bitcoin holds or diversify into other stuff. So yeah, there, there's several ways to think about it, but yeah, hopefully you don't do anything stupid in a bear market that takes you out of the game. So you can't participate in the next bull market. Yep. And I'd like to remind everybody that it's tax loss harvesting season. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good time to to do that if there's uh, opportunities popping up like we're seeing right now. It could be a better place to put some cash that is looking like dead money. Nice. All right, next question. Um, what do you think is going to happen in the inflation and interest rates? How long can the economy hodl with high interest rates? And when would the Fed and the EU or the ECB drop the rates? Yeah, I think we kind of covered this. But... Uh, I guess maybe something that we could drill down a little bit more on is like, do you guys have an idea of timing? You know, the market is, is basically looking like, Hey, maybe through next summer rates are just going to stay flat. Do you think it's going to collapse quicker than that? Or is it just really hard to predict? I think the market is closer to being right than wrong, but it's always hard to tell, you know, because a crisis can cause things to change quite quickly. But yeah, I think I mentioned earlier, I think we are starting to see slow cracks already happening, you know, on the margins here with the lagged effects of rate hikes. The, the, the real question for me now is this. Okay, so we've got what I believe are going to be lower CPI prints over the next, you know, six to 12 months. And that will give the Fed and the ECB cover to cut rates if they want. I don't think they want to cut rates very quickly. So it's really going to be this push-pull between what's actually happening in the data and you know what the Fed and, and the ECB do. Like, Are they just going to stay stubborn and behind the curve? In which case, I think we get into a weaker and weaker economy until they're finally forced to do something. And that's really, I guess, my concern at the moment is, you know, are they going to be able to react quickly enough on on the other side of things you know they've they've reacted very quickly this year to hike rates uh i think they don't want to react quickly and cut rates but i think they're going to need to if the if this economy actually cracks further and these lag effects really start to take hold you know are they going to actually pay attention to the data and do what's do what's needed um, because the soft landing is not going to happen if the fed and the ecb don't actually step back and even potentially cut rates uh so that's that's kind of how I see things. Like the real question comes down to, for me, it's not, is the data going to show the economy weakening? Is the data going to show lower inflation? It's, is the Fed slash the ECB going to actually react to it and do what's needed from a policy perspective? Well said. All right. Um, next question. Pull this up. Um, when you're traveling, I'm sure you speak 
to people in other countries about crypto? Can you give us some stories about how people there view uh, crypto and Bitcoin? Do they see it as an investment like gold, a scam, or really don't think much about it as they're just trying to get by? That's an interesting question. You know, I have traveled to a lot of places and talked to a lot of people about crypto, and I would put it in like three categories. I'd say category number one is people that are using Bitcoin as a tool literally for survival, like in places like Myanmar and Africa and maybe even like Argentina and Venezuela. Like we've talked to several people in our community that have been in Latin American countries or other places with literal hyperinflation that have used that as a way to be able to eat, right? So you have that category. The second category is like investors, like people that live in, a, you know, maybe a, a developed economy that have income and they just, they want to invest, but maybe they don't have access to a stock market in their own country. Um, or maybe they just, they don't think or understand how to invest in the U S stock market. So they just look at Bitcoin as a way to store wealth and value over time. And then you have the third, um, which is like speculators, people that are trading and, and looking to do what we do, which is be more tactical and active and grow their wealth quicker. Um, I, I do run into people occasionally now that are still like Bitcoin's a scam, but those are people that are so dogmatic in their belief that no matter what happens, I don't think anything's going to convince them otherwise. So I don't even entertain those conversations. Um, but yeah, I, I would say those are the three categories. Have you guys, uh, do any stories pop up or examples pop up for you? Um, I mean, I can't really add too much to what I've traveled with you. So I've had a lot of those same conversations, yeah. but I, I mean, I do feel like, uh, even in America, there are still so many people that just don't believe in it. They just think it's, uh, people that are investing in it are jokes and stupid mm -hmm. and, you know, I um, I don't know what it's going to take for those people. to. Uh, does Bitcoin need to be at a million dollars a coin or something for them to finally mm -hmm. be like, oh, crap, I missed out on a lot of opportunity. It goes back to the uh, regrets, right? The op mm -hmm. That's potentially one of the biggest investing regrets people may have if they don't um, follow the price action, follow the adoption. Um, so, yeah. Yep. All right. Um, got a question through wetalkmoney.com. Hey guys, I'm increasingly worried about where to buy and sell Bitcoin. FTX is gone. Binance is under more scrutiny and Coinba Coinbase is too tough with limited access to banking rails. What is the best way or alternative platforms for retail investors for trading Bitcoin? Yeah. I mean, look, there, there has been a lot of pressure on exchanges over the past year or two, right? And that is the the biggest battle is the the on ramps to the banking system. And so, my suggestion and and I can't just give a a a one size fits all answer here because people are in different countries and jurisdictions and have access to different types of banks. And so, my suggestion is always the same: go to a coin market cap or somewhere where you can look at the top exchanges by volume. And make sure they're trusted exchanges, like some of these unregulated futures exchanges will spoof their volume, but use your own judgment. Look at the top exchanges by volume and try to sign up with all of them. Trust none of them and assume that at any given day, one of them could go under like FTX. Um, even if you have, you know, Mr. Wonderful out there telling people that that's the one safe place to keep your money. Um, and hopefully by now, most people realize the only safe place to keep your money is in self-custody with a hardware wallet. But yeah, it is necessary to use, at least today, centralized exchanges. Also look at some decentralized options. And I hesitate to say any by name because I don't want to promote any specific exchange by name, but look at all the decentralized options as well. Um, we might yeah, have ETF options soon too. There we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So there, there's there's definitely different options. It's not like Bitcoin is completely cut off from the rails. I know for some people it's tougher than others. Some people have to do, you know, cash transactions locally, which also carries its own risk. And you've got to be very careful about that stuff too. 
but just do what you can put in the work to sign up for these exchanges. And you know, it, it's a pain in the ass, but that the effort there is the alpha, right? It's the, the work that it takes is why there are such incredible gains here. Um, one interesting trend that um, I think is worth mentioning too is that a lot of the traditional finance, banking, fintech players have gotten into transacting in crypto or allowing their users and customers to transact. So even like Fidelity and obviously Robinhood, uh, Interactive Brokers is now offering some limited uh, crypto options. So you know they're not perfect and they're not going to have as many feature sets as you know crypto focused brokers, but those are also a potential option on the table, at least for some amount of the allocation as well. And those have obviously had a, a longer history and some of the you know financials are even public with something like an interactive brokers. You can see their financials publicly. So yep. those would be some potential options as well. I started building out like a master list of not just exchanges, but also like brokers like Travis just mentioning and was going to set up like a notion database to like filter all the different things. Like, do they take us customers? That's a huge, you know, filter right there. And, you know, KYC and, and funding sources and things like that. It, it's a ton of work because it is a moving target. And so, yeah, my, my best advice is just look at all the exchanges and sign up for the ones that you can trust. None of them use exchanges as like an on and off ramp. Don't use it as a bank to actually store your coins. I know we've said that a bajillion times over the past decade, but FTX is a prime example of how many people just don't take that very simple advice. Um, but yeah, do what you can. All right. What other questions? Nick, I think you had a few too, didn't you? I think a few people, yeah, had responded to my tweet. Cool. Um, yeah, we got a lot of questions about like obviously Bitcoin's price. I covered that in quite a bit of detail. You can also check out the YouTube video that I posted yesterday on my channel and on my Twitter where it was basically the same video that I posted to our community. Just wanted to give to everybody that's not in the community so you guys can get an idea of the type of stuff that we do in the wealth building community. So there'll be a link below to check that out if you're not in there with us. And yeah, we can start to wrap it up there, guys. Any other questions, comments, anything that you want to pull up, any charts, anything you're looking out for over the next week? I did. Get, did you want me to? I did pull up that one question that I sure. had that uh, I thought would maybe fit in our earlier conversation. Um, what's your opinion on what looks like an imminent reversion of the yield curve? From my understanding, that has often signaled a market sell off, but that's historically when the short end was getting pushed down, not the long end rapidly rising. So, and I know we kind of talked about this earlier, but mm. essentially that's your thesis, right? Is that um, that's why bonds are maybe looking a bit more attractive than they have. Yeah, yeah. Earlier in the year, you know, the yield curve was at a historical inverted level. So typically inversions have preceded recessions by anywhere from like six to 24 months. And it's not a 100% accuracy in terms of its predictor of recessions, but we have seen ahead of major recessions, oftentimes the, the yield curve will invert, meaning the, the long end will be, um, will lower, will be lower than the short end. And so, uh, what the market is saying there is it essentially expects rates to be cut a couple of years in the future because of, you know, economic weakness that the market can see incoming. Uh, so that was the case earlier in the year. We had a very, very deep inversion in the yield curve, and that has mostly reversed itself just in the past three to four months. That's where we've seen the long end of the curve. The yields on the 10, 20, 30 year bonds have gone up a lot to sort of match where we are on the two year and uh, and some of those front end of the curve yields. So it's the yield curve is quite flat now. <laughs> and so it's not really telling us a whole lot about necessarily what the bond market expects from an economic perspective. Uh, it's hard to tease out what the signal is there. Um, you could make the case, obviously, that looking at the inversion earlier in the year, we're now into this, you know, maybe nine months of what can often be a 12 to 18 month lag before a recession. So maybe we are getting closer to that recession. And I think that is actually something that I would probably agree with, even though we can't really see it in the data yet. The economic data is not suggesting we're anywhere close to a recession yet. Uh, the unemployment rates are so low. I think that's why we've seen 
things, uh, one of the reasons why we've seen things be stronger than expected this year. But again, lag effects take take time. The, these things take time, and we we know that there's starting to be weakness on the on the margins. And so I think uh, I think we are probably more likely headed for at least a, a weakening economy in the next six to twelve months. And uh, the question is how 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 weaker are we going to get? Again, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. A lot of this is unfortunately going to depend on what Fed policymakers and other policymakers do. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know, at some point, the soft landing is going to be harder and harder to achieve. So we'll see. Um, I don't think it means you need to bunker down necessarily. Obviously, I think there's a lot of cheap assets out there already. Um, but maybe it does warrant some caution and just slowness in sort of scaling into those. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But yeah, I mean, um, yield curves, not the 100% best predictor of everything that happens. It's investors that are making their predictions in the market. So it's not like they have some crystal ball. Always keep that in mind. Well said. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to pull back this chart, you know, talking about the percentage of stocks that are below the 100 period moving average and how that is getting into juicy territory. But even though it's, it's down around what, like 24% right now, it could still get a lot lower. So yeah, we got to single that. digits during, I think, 2020 and then also GFC timeframe as well. So it yep. can get a lot worse before it gets better. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I guess for now, we'll all just pile in to Bitcoin and <laughs> uh, kiss the stock market goodbye for now. And uh, <laughs> no, this is when this is when you need to pay the most attention in stocks. This is when you need buy to be low. No, we don't do that. <laughs> yes, my friends, buy low. That's that's the point that we're trying to make. <laughs> well do we want to make Do we want to make a bet on if the S and P five hundred is going to break down further or hold support here? Well, what's your be, opinion on that it? That might I'm be curious. a fun bet. Yeah, where where do you land on on that, Nick? Mm, I land on we're probably heading lower. This price action isn't looking great, um, but I don't know. That's where I'm at. We're below the 200 day moving average now in the S and P. We have very bearish price action intraday going into more earnings. Um, I, I don't know. I, it's not looking good, guys. Yeah, but, I mean the, the Nasdaq is is as of right now looking like it's going to close below the basically the whole summer's lows. So we close the gap from June, and things are looking heavy. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, this could be a trap, could right? Be. This could be a bear trap. But yeah, things are definitely looking heavy, and there's a lot of downside potential. You know, back to fourteen thousand, it wouldn't be hard to get there in the uh, the NQ. In fact, that's the 38% retracement, the 200 period moving average, the next um, prior resistance level turn support. So there's definitely some downside potential. I will yeah. go ahead, Trav. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to add, you know, if you look at Apple's chart, it looks you know, pretty, pretty prime for a further breakdown. And you, the indices have been held up by big tech and, you know, with big tech cracking a little bit, that definitely could take those indices lower. And I think that will ultimately prove to be a pretty good opportunity, given the fact that we've already seen deep corrections in a lot of stocks. And so if the indices and big tech crack as well, that's just going to add further pressure to the rest of the market. And I think we're, we'll get to levels that from for a long term investor perspective really are going to be very lucrative for you know some of that accumulation. So I'm actually rooting for this to break down. And it, it makes total sense that it could, given the fact that big tech has held up while the rest of the market's fallen and so big tech could just be catching up here and needs to needs to correct further yeah but well i will say it would be on brand for this to be a bear trap at some point i wouldn't be surprised but but we'll have to see well, well yeah one piece of positive news could be or one positive catalyst could be uh happening in november which is one fed fed confirms a pause at their meeting i believe november one or november november one or november two i can't remember the exact date but it's sometime the very beginning of november and yep. then if you have that october cpi number come in cooler than expected you know around i think the first or second week of november that could provide a little mini rally for the market and then of mm -hmm. course you go into a stronger seasonal period too with november and december being it tends to on average be a better time for the market uh, that could help as well. Although, you know, if we get 
too further deep into a correction, then all of a sudden November, December become tax selling months and further exacerbates a decline. So yeah, and this is going to be a big tax selling year, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're still up up year to date on quite a bit of stuff, so it's not there yet. But individual um, names, I mean, a that's lot true. of individual names have been pummeled. So that's especially true. people that dumped into the tech stuff in twenty one. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of tax selling opportunity there underneath yeah. the broad index surface. Yeah. I just remembered that I didn't even bring up the Bitcoin dominance chart and talk about altcoins. <laughs> 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 so Bitcoin dominance is at its highest level since the spring of 2021. Um, and so even with this bounce, alts are not keeping up with Bitcoin. Um, but this is typically how we see the capital flow. It's like step one, Bitcoin gets a big breakout. And then when Bitcoin pulls back, some of that capital goes into alts. So we have seen a little bit of a pop in the ETH USD chart. So on a, a USD basis, ETH has had about a 20% move to the upside, but it's actually been bleeding out compared to Bitcoin. So even though ETH is up, it's down compared to Bitcoin. And what this is telling me is there is still not an appetite for alts. There are some alts that are breaking out and there's, there are some that are looking strong and actually showing relative strength over Bitcoin. But for the most part, I'd say like 95% of alts are still bleeding out compared to Bitcoin. So that's one thing that I'm going to be watching for over the next week or two is does this reverse and do we start to get signs that we're going back into some kind of alt season? I wrote about this in the Daily Doe a couple days ago, just showing this resistance level and said, hey guys, watch out. If we break this, this is actually a good sign for alts. And so the, the, mark, the crypto market cap, excluding Bitcoin and ETH is actually up quite a bit. And I think we're not going to be in a confirmed bull market until we break above this like 450 billion market cap resistance level. So we're still not there, but we are starting to see some early signs of life. And will we go back into a full on alt season? I, I think the odds are lower because we still have all that regulatory pressure and the FTX fallout and SEC lawsuits and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I think maybe, you know, a handful of, higher quality projects could really start to see some gains here. So that's what I'm going to be watching for over the next week or two. Nice. Very interesting. All interesting right. times well, here. Yes. We've got a lot to chat about. You know, I'm sad that I'm back uh, out of my motorcycle trail riding experience, but it's good to be back dialed in on the markets with you guys. Heck yeah. All right. All right, guys. Well, uh, anything else you want to chat about before we wrap it up? No, I think that we covered most of it. Uh, cool. Go to wetalkmoney.com, anyone that's listening, and submit your questions because we do, as you see here today, we review those and answer them. So if you got a question, go to wetalkmoney.com and submit it. Yep. And go to wetalkmoney.com forward slash community. Check out the wealth building community. Get in our Discord channel, see our live market updates, alerts, all that fun stuff. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week. And we'll be watching these markets like a hawk. Mm -hmm. See you guys. Ciao. Cheers.